Welcome back to the channel. So today I want to share with you how I went from zero to 90 units in six years to share my whole real estate investing journey to show it from start to finish and my mindset at each step of the way. So let's rewind all the way back to 2013. So 2013 is when I graduated from pharmacy school with $250,000 of student debt. So from 2013 to 2017, I was working as a full-time pharmacist and I was actually job hopping to increase my W-2 income. So I went from around $120,000 and then I jumped to a job where I was making around $160,000. Uh, as a pharmacist, my mindset back then was, well, if I'm gonna work the same amount of hours, I might as well maximize how much I'm paid per hour to increase my income so that I can pay off my student loans faster. So that was really my mindset. So during those four years, I lived very humbly I live like a college student still, you know, if um, my first job, I was just renting a room out for like 400 bucks a month, which is really cheap. And then my second job, I was fortunate to be close to my parents home. So I was able to uh, parent tech and live uh, at my childhood house uh, growing up for free. So because of that, you know, I was fortunate to have that situation. I was able to save more money and I was able to pump out more money into my student loans while keeping my monthly expense exactly the same right so the biggest expense that you deal with is number one is going to be your rent and number two is just going to be what you do what you eat and all that so for me i never really bypassed you know, excluding rent about a thousand dollars a month between going out to eat going out to do things buying random things here and there getting new clothes going to the movies whatever that was um, I, I typically kept it around $1,000 a month on average, and that stayed exactly the same from 2013 all the way to 2017 um, while I was as a pharmacist. I didn't lifestyle inflate. I didn't lifestyle creep. I maintained it exactly the same because I was used to just, you know, renting a room and sharing that the rents of other renters. I wasn't used to having any privacy at all. You know, I still had that college mentality, so I leveraged it. In 2017, that's when I got my first uh, director of pharmacy job. And that's when I went into kind of pharmacy management. You know, obviously with that, your income's going to go up as well. Um, so once again, my W-2 went up. I kept my lifestyle exactly the same at $1,000 a month, and I would save more and more money. So what I did was over time, I paid off my student loans uh, in about four years in 2017. So at that point, I, instead of dumping that money into my student loans because it's now gone, actually took that money and would save up. I was saving up for a down payment, right? I was able to save like six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month um, just through my W-2. And my goal was to save up for a 10% down payment. So in the Bay Area, for those of you who don't know, it's very high cost of living. The average cost of a home back then in 2017 was around a million dollars in the San Jose area. Uh, in the Fremont area, it was probably around you know 1.5 million. And in, you know, Dublin, Pleasanton, Livermore, it's a little bit more affordable. It's under a million dollars. So I just said, okay, well, I'm gonna need to save up between eighty to hundred thousand dollars to do ten percent down, and live in that house as a primary residence. So that that was my initial goal. Like, hey, I'm 27 now. Um, you know, want to leave the nest finally, and what the next logical step is to buy a house for yourself, right? It's I was always taught like you should, you know, own a house and uh, eventually pay it off. So next goal was saved up, you know, 80 to $100,000. And then I bought my first single family home in Livermore, California for $825,000. Um, actually, uh, a relative was a real estate agent. So what kind of helped me was he actually gave me 1% of his commissions to help cover a lot of the closing costs. So it ended up being around $8,000, which I got back to help, you know, lower my closing costs. I had to down uh, 10%, which was $80,000. Um, and at the time, there was no PMI for downing 10%, um, which was amazing, right? It, it was um, through, I think the lender was, I'm blanking on the name. I want to say Loan Depot. I believe it was Loan Depot back then. But anyways, I downed 10%. 825000 was a purchase price, and my interest rate was 4%. So I think my mortgage... My insurance has HOA there, um, you know, including all utilities. I think my total expense, including everything, was forty five uh, hundred a month, 
right? So I just said, okay, well, I'm living in this four bedroom, three bath, 2,300 square foot house. You know, this is still too much roof space for one person. So what I did was I started house hacking without even knowing what house hacking was. So what I was doing was I lived in the master bedroom, which was huge, right? It's literally bigger than the apartment complex that I'm currently living in right now, uh, ironically, but it was huge. I had my own private, you know, uh, bathroom, the master bathroom, and I had three other rooms um, that were empty, right? Like two rooms shared one bathroom and then the other ba room uh, had its own private bathroom. So I just said, okay, let me post these rooms on uh, Craigslist on Facebook Marketplace and, and rent these out. So what I did was I started off at around, you know, obviously you can do some market research, right? So I looked on Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, um, Zillow, Redfin, see how much the rents were per room. And kind of the average price was around $1,000. So what I decided to do was, um, you know, I already furnished the whole house because I thought this was going to be my forever home. Um, so I furnished the whole house. It costed around $10,000 to furnish everything. You know, all bedrooms, kitchen, living room, family room, all that stuff. And I furnished it. And kind of a pro tip is I actually bought it um, wholesale because my mom, she actually knew a um, furniture wholesaler. So they would actually sell to like bigger stores, like, you know, living spaces, uh, for example, or like the Ashley's Furniture Store. So they'd actually sell to them, but because I was able to buy direct to the manufacturer, it was at a discount, right? Because they're just selling it um you know to me at the same price they sell it to the furniture stores and the furniture store then up market right that's how they make their profit to cover all their overhead expense so because of my mom's connection i was able to buy furniture at a discount that's how i was able to furniture my um you know whole property for about ten thousand. and now that i'm thinking about it, that's probably a good leverage contact if you know if i ever wanted to do you know midterm rentals or, or short-term rentals down the road i i have the base expense is going to be the furniture so if i have a direct contact to a furniture wholesaler, then, um, you know, it cuts a lot of your cost. But in any case, I, I furnished it, um, you know, advertised it on Facebook marketplace and, you know, I started at a thousand dollars just to test the market. And I had a lot of interest, right? Like people would email me through Craigslist, get a lot of responses to Facebook marketplace. And, and typically, you know, out the gate, what I would put in the listing was I want a thousand dollars a month. It's fully furnished. You know, it's open to month to month contracts to kind of attract people, but you know, obviously, you know, one year lease would be preferred. Um, you know, utilities were included. So, you know, I was a landlord, I was living there. So I would, you know, include water, electricity, gas, you know, internet. So people kind of like that convenience a, a little bit. And so then, you know, I would, you know, message them. You know, I would ask, hey, like, if you're serious about this, we'd, we can schedule a on-site viewing. It was easy, I live there. And if you're serious about moving forward, you're gonna have to show me some bank statements for the past three months, some pay stubs for the past three months. Um, you're gonna have to give me a, a security deposit hold of one month's rent, so it's a thousand bucks. And then when you move in, um, if you move on the first, it's gonna be a thousand bucks. If it's not, we'll prorate the rent, right? So that's how I kind of did it. And then, you know, I would just, I Googled like basic lease, generic lease agreements online. You just can Google it like California lease agreements and there's generic forms out there. That's how I got started. Um, so I would print that out. They would come, um, you know, they would show me their credit score. They would do the bank statements, you know, pay stubs. You know, back then I wasn't sophisticated. I didn't do background checks. You know, looking back, I probably should have, um, you know, view their credit scores. And then, you know, basically they would sign, if everything was good on their part, it was good on my part, I would, we would sign the lease, get the deposit. You know, I take pictures of their you know, driver's license, um, you know, for documentation, and then they would basically move in. So basically, a lot of people that I preferred when I was house hacking was, you know, they, they work, they're working professionals, they were never home, they was out and about, right? Because basically, because I was living there, I still wanted some privacy, I want people who are never home, essentially, right? <laughs> so I would purposely pick people who are never home. So eventually, I did that, I was able to rent out, you know, within like two months, I think I got all those three rooms rented out. The, the, the two rooms of the shared bathroom was a thousand bucks a month. And the one with the private bathroom was 1100 per month. So basically every month they would sell me their money. So I, I, I prefer electronic payment, you know, some paid cash, some paid credit uh, check. I mean, that was okay. Cause I was living there, but you know, when I moved out, I wanted everything electronic um, to be better and, you know, more convenient for me. Cause I usually don't like holding it to cash. 
Um, so I did that and doing that, I learned how to properly manage it. You know, I learned how to deal with uh, conflicts. I learned how to, you know, do contracts, how to screen tenants and all that. So it kind of gave me a good sense of, you know, trying to read people and whatnot. And, you know, it's a great learning experience for me. Like what I want to do it again. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I say that, but you know, obviously I'm living in an apartment right now, but let's say I were to buy another single family home. Um, and at that point, if I had an extra bedroom and it wasn't too inconvenient, I might consider house hacking or, you know, renting out one room again for extra income. It doesn't hurt. Right. So, um, you know, basically able to lease these out, you know, a lot of these people, to be honest, were much older than me. So I got to learn how to deal with older people. And, you know, that could be a challenge given that I was, you know, 27 at the time, you know, I'm young, younger looking. Uh, and, but, you know, fortunately I was a pharmacy director. So I was kind of used to dealing with people who were much older than me, much more experienced than me and you know, hadn't had any issues that way. Um, so yeah, that's how I got started. So I, I was basically getting, you know, thirty one hundred dollars a month my all in expense including utilities everything was 4500 a month so i was basically only paying about um what is that 24 uh, 1400 to live in that master bedroom and build equity in that house right so i was like oh this is amazing right and you know fast forward to today i mean you know six years later it's worth around 1.2 to 1.3 million dollars i bought it for 800k so that's you know you know, 400 to $500,000 worth of equity that I forced or that the market forced over time. So that's where I got started. Right. And once I bought the house, uh, to be honest, a 10% down, it wiped all my money. It wiped all my savings. So at that point I repeat the same process, right? So I was only living there for like 1400 a month. My income was increasing through W2 and my goal was to save again for another 10% down payment for another you know, single family home. So what I did was I got a new job in San Francisco. So I said, okay, yeah, I've been living here for a year and a half. I can't commute from where I was to San Francisco. It's too long of a commute. You know, I don't like commuting. So at that point, I basically repeated the process. I found another house in San Francisco, um, down 10%. So I ended up being $1.1 million. I downed 110 K. Uh, my interest rate was 3.75%. Uh, once again, no PMI. I use US Bank because my aunt works for US Bank. So, you know, she got me great loans. She's one of the top producers there. So, you know, I got really great uh, interest rates. She gave me like some credit back to help cover some of my closing costs. You know, once again, I used my realtor who was a family member and she basically covered my closing costs as well. Uh, got me some credit to cover my closing costs. I basically had zero closing costs, put 110 down to buy this. Um, I think five bedroom, um, two and a half bath, uh, makeshift duplex. So in San Francisco, it's very common where you have a, a upper unit. So the upper unit, um, you know, is where I was stayed. It had the master bedroom, it had two bedrooms, one bath, kitchen, as well as, um, you know, living room, family room. So that's where I lived. And then they had a lower unit that had a separate entrance. So they actually entered through the side gate and did through the side door, or they can go through the garage. And in that unit, it was a two bedroom, uh, one bath. It didn't have a kitchen. It was a wet bar because it's not a legal duplex. So a wet bar, you ever seen a wet bar in a kitchen is a wet bar. It doesn't have a stove, right? So you can have a refrigerator, you can have a sink, you can have a, you know, microwave, but it just doesn't have a stove, right? So it's a little bit inconvenient, but the property I bought was near, uh, San Francisco State University, as well as San Francisco City College. So, you know, I knew I could rent out to some college students and they don't typically cook, right? So what the college students end up doing was, you know, they just brought their own microwave, you know, that's plug-in. They brought air fryer, that's plug-in. I cook a lot through air fryer personally. And you can actually buy these like tabletop uh, electric stoves from Costco for like maybe 200, 300 bucks. And you just plug it in as well and it works just as great, right? So, you know, it, it was kind of like a, a makeshift, duplex it didn't it was just kind of like a wet bar is what i called it two bedroom one bath and a little living room right and they had their own entrance so i never saw those tenants right we, we would i'd only see those tenants when i was in the garage using the washer and dryer because that was shared or every time i went in the garage then you know i i could um you know i, I might see them and what was kind of nice too is what a lot of people do in san francisco is i can expand that lower unit so it's only two bedroom one bath with a wet bar 
But if I were to convert the kitchen, the, the whole area where the garage was, which is very common, um, I probably could have added one to two more bedrooms, to be honest, at least one bedroom for sure and expand upon the, you know, the family room kitchen or the wet bar area. So that could have been a three bedroom, one bath, um, you know, with permits and all that. So basically it would be a three bedroom potentially on the bottom and three bedroom on top. So what I did was I rented out the, you know, I bought the property. I was living in the master bedroom upstairs. And once again, I repeat the process. I went on Facebook marketplace, advertised, uh, rent by the room. This time I learned my lesson. I made it unfurnished because I realized that whether you rent it furnished or unfurnished, you get the same rent. They can bring their own furniture. And some people prefer bringing their own furniture because they don't trust the furniture that you have. So basically I did that, right? So I rented out the two other rooms upstairs to working professionals for 1200 bucks each. And then the lower unit I actually rented out for $2,800 total. And that included, uh, you know, water, electricity, gas, internet, right? So for them, it was like four college students. So they paid 700 bucks each. So they liked it, right? They were basically like room sharing and they could walk over to the university or take the Muni um, to the university. It was very close, very convenient to, you know, all modes of transportation. So, you know, it, it was nice. Like I think my monthly payment on that property, I'm, I'm kind of blanking out on it, but I think it was like around maybe $7,000. Um, but I was getting 2,400 upstairs, 2,800 downstairs. So that's 5,400. So once again, I was only paying like 1600 to live in San Francisco and the property was building equity, right? So once again, and I only down 10%. So that's why my, my monthly loan payment was higher. So, you know, like once again, I was living in San Francisco for 600 bucks a month. I was building equity. My income went up because I got a new director job that paid me more. And, you know, once again, I, I, I saved money again, right? So what I did was I, I saved up another 10% down and I relocated to Southern California, which is where I'm currently based out of. And I repeat the same process, right? I bought it. I got a new job. I down 10% um, on a house and actually intended to live there, right? So um, it, it was a house I think I got for $770,000. I down 10%, so it's about 77 k But this time, you know, I didn't get the, I had to pay PMI. Right. And people freak out, but the PMI was roughly an additional $150 a month. Right. And I bought it. And my plan for this one was to build an ADU in the backyard. So an ADU is an accessory dwelling unit. So California passed a law where um, you can have an ADU, detached ADU built in the backyard. Right. You can convert a detached garage into an ADU, or you can build it, you know, from the ground up from scratch, uh, an ADU in the backyard. You know, there's certain requirements in terms of the size. I think in Orange County, it was the max you can do was a thousand square foot. Um, so at a thousand square feet, you can build a pretty decent sized two bedroom, two bath, or maybe a three bedroom, one bath, or three bedroom, uh, two bath, right? It might be a little bit smaller rooms, but it's doable, right? So you could build a detached ADU and then you can convert the garage into a junior ADU, assuming you live in it, right? So if you don't live in it, you can only do the detached ADU. If you live in it, you can do the detached ADU and convert the garage into a junior ADU. So, you know, that one's easier, right? Because the garage is already built, infrastructure is there. You probably spend 30 to 50K. You can build a little, you know, one bedroom, one bath studio. Or, sorry, you build a studio so it has like a full kitchen. Um, you can build in their dishwasher for them, their room, the bathroom. So it's pretty simple, right? It's probably about, you know, 300 to 400 square foot. So it's doable. So my goal was to actually live in there, build a detached ADU, and then convert the garage to a junior ADU. So that was my strategy and goal. So I just thought, okay, I can live in here. Once again, the master bedroom, I could rent out the other rooms, um, the other two bedrooms in the main house um, to a tenant. And then I can slowly save up thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, convert the garage to a junior ADU. And then over time, um, I, I can build a detached ADU, which is a two bedroom, two bath, and then rent that out as well. But what ended up happening was it ended up costing a lot of money, right? The detached ADU was two hundred fifty thousand dollars. At the at the time, there's there's no way to finance it, right? The only way to finance it is you either pay cash, or you get a HELOC on one of your current properties. You know, two hundred fifty thousand dollars of a HELOC. At the time, I didn't have that amount of equity. Or you can, um, if you bought the property, you know, right, you can build in a construction loan with it. But that's a way more complicated. So. Um, because of that, I decided, you know what, I don't want to do this. 
it's too much money. And what I ended up deciding was I, I actually ended up not moving into it. Like I, I was literally, I think I lived there for like, you know, one or two months and decided, you know what, it doesn't make sense for me to move here. Uh, actually, my job moved again. So I just said, hey, it's too far of a commute. So I moved into an apartment where I just lived by myself. You know, I had a girlfriend, so you don't want some privacy. You don't want to house hack as much anymore. Um, so just said, okay, well, it just makes more sense for me to just rent out this whole, you know, three bedroom, two bath um, house. And, you know, I was able to rent it out for 3500 And, you know, I think my all-in cost was around 3900 So I was actually negative 400 bucks a month in cash flow on this property, despite self-managing it. But I just thought, you know what, I want an apartment, you know, want some privacy. And, and you know, I've been house hacking for so long. I'm older now, in my, in my 30s. So I want some privacy, right? But, you know, I still am open even to this day. Like, I still own the asset. Like, if I move back into that property, I can always... What I'm probably going to do is I'm probably going to convert that garage into a junior ADU and I would just live in the main house by myself, you know, with my girlfriend, um, just have the three bedroom, two bath all to myself. I can create one room to be a, like a studio, an office, and use that as a tax write off. I can live in the master bedroom. You know, it's not that big of a house. I think the house is like maybe 1300 square foot. You know, it's a smaller three bedroom, two bath house with a big lot. So like what I thought about doing was I have about thirty fifty thousand dollars $50,000. I can easily convert that garage. Uh, pay for that, you know, get it converted to garage. They can have their own entrance. I never see them. You know, I can live off the garage. I just can park in the driveway. No big deal. Uh, and I can rent that out or I can Airbnb that for higher income, right? So I, I, I can still do that to this day if I, if I were to get another job back in Orange County. Um, and that's what I probably would do. And then actually that property built up a lot of equity. So I bought for 770K. It's probably, it just appraised at 950K. Um, looking on, you know, Zillow, it says it's worth around 1.1 million or, you know, between one to 1.1 million. So like a lot of equity built up. So what I could do is now at this point, cause I locked in such a low interest rate of 2.7%, I can get a HELOC, right? In second position with a combined loan to value of 80%, right? So let me, let me just crunch some numbers real quick. So let's just say the house is now worth, uh, $1 million. I can get 80% combined loan to value. So that's an $800,000 loan. The current loan on the property is $670,000. That's $130,000. So I could get a HELOC on that property, get a HELOC on my other uh, property, which has over half a million dollars of equity to get my HELOC uh, to get about $250,000 to use that to buy and build a detached ADU. In the backyard that's a thousand square foot right so at that point i could airbnb that out as well i could actually move back there and rent out the main house right i can rent out the main house um for let's say 3500 and i can rent out the garage studio for let's just say i don't even know let's just say 1700 and then i could basically live in that brand new two bedroom two bath with my girlfriend in the backyard you know, myself and just, I all have to do is just pay the monthly HELOC payment for that. So that, that's a great way to do that. So that's a great way to get like, so I'm renting the main house for 3,700 and that studio I can rent out for, let's say 1,700. That's about $5,400 of rent. So, you know, I can still do that to this day. I'm still thinking about it, but you know, it really depends where the job market takes me. But that's what I love about real estate, right? Like assuming, I mean, the law is good until 2025. I mean, if they don't renew it, then I might be screwed a little bit but I can still build it now and being proactive. And I did tell the current tenants that when they leased the property, my goal was I wanted to build something in the backyard, right? But and I'm moving forward with it, but in the lease, it clearly states that I, I have the option to build something back there. So they might not get as much privacy, at least in the backyard, right? So that's what I'm really thinking about. Like I can eventually get that house, create it into like a triplex almost, right? With the studio and the garage, the main house, and then the backyard house. And at that point, I can move to the next house I want. So that's what's great about real estate. You have so many options with that. So, um, you know, like I said earlier, I paid PMI on that, but I just got it reappraised uh, two years later and it appraised at 950. So I have enough equity in the deal. So they removed my PMI. So I save $150 a month now. So it rents for 3,700. My total cost is around 3,900. So, you know, I'm still negative $200 in cash flow a month, but during the next two years, when the lease 
uh, for me, I'm going to raise it to 3,900 or 4,000. That point, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making a little bit cash flow or breaking even, assuming no, you know, expenses and whatnot. Um, so after that, I just said, you know what, um, maybe don't want to house hack as much anymore. I kind of want a little more cash flow because um, California is all appreciation, right? It's more of appreciation play, not necessarily cash flow day one, unless you do midterm rental, short term rental. So that's what I might be considering doing later once my current tenants leave. You know, right now it's pretty passive. It's been the same tenants there. I don't want to rock the boat, but if they were to leave, I might consider doing like, you know, Airbnb or um, midterm rental, right? To, to increase the amount of cash flow I get so that these properties are actually cash flowing. Um, so after that, I said, you know what? I want to do something cheaper. So I started looking at out of state. So I, I looked into Huntsville, Alabama, and I knew about it because my dad's an aerospace engineer. My cousin's an aerospace engineer, and they have one of the largest Air Force bases there. They have, I think, Space Forces there. Basically, there's a lot of rocket scientists there. There's a high density of people with PhDs in Huntsville, Alabama. So you're going to get really good tenants, right? Like people who make good money. Um, you know, they're white collared workers, great incomes, and they just can't afford to buy a house, right? So I was researching there, you know, I was networking in bigger pockets, and then a realtor, you know, reached out to me and said, Hey, like we have these new construction properties that cost around two fifty and they rent for like two thousand dollars. I just said, Whoa, wait a second. Like that's almost the one percent rule. Right? Like the one percent rule would be twenty five hundred, but I just said, All right, well, show me some of these deals. And those, they had connections of builders. And I just said, okay, well, let's, let's run the numbers, right? They said, okay, well, these builders, they have preferred lenders. If you use them, they'll give you a discount, you know, some closing credits to reduce your closing costs. And I just said, okay, 250, you know, at the down around, you know, 20%. So that's about 50, 60 K. And then my interest rate was three and a half percent fixed for 30 years. So I ran the math and, you know, insurance was about 800 a year, property tax around the same. Uh, HOA was at 500 bucks a year. So my, my all in PITI um, plus, I believe, property management, which was 10% of the rents, um, was around 1300 And I can rent that thing out for $2,000. So I just said, wow, cash flowing 700 bucks a month. I mean, albeit, you know, some has to be saved for reserves and CapEx, but it was brand new, new construction, had one year warranties and everything guaranteed by the builder. So if anything broke in that one year or the next couple of years, I still have warranties. So my property manager knew, okay, well, if anything breaks, check the warranty first. If it doesn't, it's not covered, then I pay for it. Right. So I just said, okay, you know, I bought it down 60 K. I was like, this is amazing. Right. Down 60 K I'm cash flowing 700 bucks a month. You know, it took about three months to rent out. So, you know, I was buying the bullet, you know, paying the, the mortgage, all that stuff. I think it was 1100 bucks a month, you know, out of pocket. So you get to be cognizant of that. But then once I got rented out, you know, I've been, I've been having the same tenants for the same two years. And every year we raised the rent. So it went from 2000 to 2100 and probably at the renewal this year in, in June of 2023, it's probably going to be 2200, right? So the rents go up, they're paying down the house. Uh, it's pretty low key, low maintenance. And I just said, wow, this is amazing. Like I can scale this. Like I could literally sell um, my single family home I own in California, which has like half a million dollars of equity in it. I can take that equity, 1031 exchange it and buy like, you know, if I have half a million dollars and I'm downing like, let's say 60, 70 K, I could probably buy like, you know, seven, seven, six, seven of these single family homes. And I'll be golden, right? I buy seven of these. I'm cash flowing, you know, 700 bucks a month. That's going to be about a $5,000 a month, right? 4,900 a month. I just said, wow, like I can exchange this California property, which is break even, slightly negative, And I can buy brand new um, single family homes in Huntsville, Alabama. that cash flow 700 bucks a month day one and rents will go up every year. So over the next five years, the rents are going to go up gradually, right? So I'm making 5000 a month. I raise the next year, I raise it by 100 bucks each unit. Now it's going to be, you know, assuming I own eight, it's going to be 5800 a month. So it goes up every year, 800 bucks in cash flow, you know, assuming no major repairs, right? And then you're good for CapEx because the house is only like two, three years old. So I just said, wow, I, I got to scale this. But shortly after buying that, um, I just got into multifamily, right? So you know, joined a mentorship, basically it was around people who 
We're buying apartment complexes left and right. You know, sh given the guidance to give me confidence to move forward. You know, I've been studying a lot myself, but just being committed, you know, paying for the mentorship, you know, obviously it's expensive. And you can check out my multi making multifamily mentorship down below. Um, there's a one month trial where you can pay for it, try it for a month, get access to all the materials for a month. If you like it, you can then um, reach out to me and upgrade to the lifetime access. Um, the one month trial is $500. And then the um, lifetime access is going to be 2,500 bucks. So like I said, you can try it. If you don't like it, great. You just you know spent a little bit of money. But if you do like it, you can then get the lifetime access. So, so far the value, the feedback has been great. If you like lecture style learning, you're going to learn a lot from it. But for me personally, I benefit a lot from mentorship, you know, cost a lot of money to join one. I paid about, you know, 20,000 bucks to join one, which is, you know, way more expensive than my course in mentorship, but it made me accountable. It made me committed and made me want to succeed. Right. So that's what I did. And I started doing direct mail. You can see my video down below. I use prop stream um and property radar to get my off-market leads i have videos on those and i use yell letters complete to do outsource my direct mailing campaign if you want me to do your mailers for you i do have a service uh below just click on the course and click on the direct mailing service i do six month and 12 months mailings for you so i'll pull up the leads for you on prop stream and property radar i will you know coordinate the letters for you and then basically i will tweak the letters based on your response right so what I did was I sent out 300 letters per month for six months, uh, average of 3% response rate. So about 10 people would call back every time, negotiate the owners off market. And why I went off market was because the brokers, they typically do not like working with new people, right? There's a lot of unserious buyers in the world. I'm going through it right now, right? Selling a mobile park, there's a lot of unserious buyers. They just make you bad offers or they make an offer and they don't have the money. You know, it's just a lot of sketchiness between it. It gets very frustrating. So, you know, um, as a result, I don't blame the brokers. They want to work with people they worked with before. So they bring all their good deals to the people they've closed up before. So brokers don't trust you. Lenders don't trust you because you don't have a track record. And, um, you know, if you want to raise money, no one trusts you because you don't have a track record, right? So it's kind of hard, right? It's like, how do I get experience if no one trusts me? So even though I own single family homes, they didn't care, right? They wanted to see that I had experience with multifamily. It's a different multifamily, like, apartment complexes are a business, right? It's more business oriented. So what I did was, okay, if, if no one, if brokers won't bring me good deals, if there's no good deals on LoopNet or Crexy, um, I don't want to cry about it. Let's send direct mail. So I go direct to owner, right? So my goal was I want to find a deal so good that a lender will lend on me despite me having no experience, right? And that's exactly what I did. I sent out 300 letters for six months, 1800 letters. And then I got a owner for a 26 unit who called me. He actually emailed, he actually never talked to me. He would only communicate through me via email and he was a lawyer. And he just said, Hey, like, thank you for reaching out. I'm looking to sell my apartment complex. And I just would say, Hey, um, tell me about the property. You know, how many, how many units is it? How many are one bedroom? How many are two bedroom? Do you pay? Does a landlord pay? What utilities does the landlord pay? What utilities does the tenant pay? So the landlord pays water trash and he actually paid electricity and gas. Those all bills paid. Right. So at the gate, I knew that the expense would be high because, you know, the tenants just played 500 bucks flat, include all utilities. They can blast the AC, blast the heater all day, leave the house. And who pays the landlord, not the tenant. Right. So, and then he just said that, yeah, like, here's my, you know, P and L statement for the past three years. You know, I trusted what he gave me, you know, it could have been fabricated, but I looked at the numbers expense ratio was around 50, 55%. So you, I think he was being honest. Um, you know, he self-managed a property despite running a law firm full time. He did his own pest control. He did his own, he was also he did his own realtor. He was on maintenance. He actually had an office in one unit. So he would work out of there while managing it. So he is your typical mom and pop owner that wanted to retire. Right. So he just said, you know, make me an offer. You know, once again, run my sales comps, you can run it on prop stream and property radar. Um, I'm actually working on a video for that, but you can run to figure out what's the price per unit in the average area. So I figured that, you know, the average price per unit was uh, probably around 30, 40 K per unit, you know, fixed up would be 50 K per unit. Um, but this one needs some fixing. So, you know, I did my due diligence, inspected all the units. I was actually on site for that, uh, and ended up making an offer for 520 K, which was the tax assessed price. So. I, I run three methods, right? Tax assessed price, 
net operating income divided by market cap, right? It's around seven cap market in Oklahoma City. Um, and then the price per unit. So usually I take the lowest of the three and it's always a tax assessed price. And that's public information. So you just go in the tax county tax assessor office, look it up. That's how I make my offer. If they ask you why, you just say, oh, it's the tax record price. So he said that, okay, he actually took my offer and I bought it, you know, and then I got it appraised and actually appraised at $750,000 day one. So I basically made, so I bought for 520K, I negotiated 60K in seller or 70K in seller repair credit. So I'm all in for 450K, right? And then I bought it appraised at 750K day one. So I made 300K almost of equity day one, buying it right. So I just said, wow, this is amazing. So, you know, it's a huge value add. So currently fast forward today, I'm, I renovated about half the units so far. A lot of delays in renovation, you know, for the first I think year, like there's no renovations done. The general contractor was backed up. And then now they started renovation. We renovate about half of them and we're leasing out the new tenants. And now we're kind of doing, um, renovating the remaining 10 units, you know, not as heavy, obviously, but now we're renovating those. Um, so, so yeah, you know, all done. It's probably gonna be worth around one, $1.5 million. So I bought it for half a million, you know, roughly putting around, it's at 300,000, all in 800. It's gonna be worth around 1.5 million to cash out refinance. So that was in June of 2021, right? So let's backtrack a bit. I bought my Orange County property in January, 2021. I bought my Alabama single family new build in March of 2021. And I bought my 26 unit in, no, sorry, it was actually August of 2021. Yeah, August of 2021. And then in November, so three months later of 2021, I bought my mobile home park in Alabama. And once again, how I came across it was, wait a second, like I can buy a 200 lot mobile home park. I mean, only about 30 homes were actually there for $1 million and it'll sell our finance. I just thought, this is insane. Like, how can I get a deal this cheap? I mean, yeah, it's a huge value at deal. It requires a lot of capital, a lot of work, a lot of stress, right? So basically when I bought it, you know, I fixed up all a lot of the vacant park owned homes, rented those out, tore down some homes, ripped those out, and I brought in some new homes, uh, 100% financed, you know, 45K each, rented it, you know, monthly payment it was around 400 bucks a month, and I can rent those out for 750. So it's about 350 a month. You know, that typically includes a lot rent. So it wasn't bad, right? You're 100% leveraged. You can cash flow about 350 a month. And I, I just said, okay, I, I want to prove this model out, right? And then flip this to a larger syndicator. So that's exactly what I'm doing right now. I, you know, I proved the model out. And after bringing in, you know, renovating a bunch of those vacant homes, tearing down a bunch of homes and bringing in, you know, two, three brand new homes to uh, rent out. Now I'm basically presenting it to syndicators. And then that's what I'm currently in contract with, right? It's a larger syndicator where they're raising money and they'll basically bring the plan all the way, right? So my park's currently like, you know, 45. So I brought from like 30 to like 45. And then now they're going to try to bring it all the way, right? Like they're going to try to bring it to like a hundred plus. It's a 200 lot mobile home park. So this one was actually a fix and flip for me. Um, and a little bit of shiny object syndrome. So I have another video talking about that. And then after that, um, fast forward to May of 2022, I bought my 20 unit apartment complex. So this one, you know, I got for 350 K. It was actually from that same letter batch that I sent out for my 26 unit. Um, you know, the owner actually sent me a postcard back and I called him. We started negotiating, talking. He just wanted to tax this price. I knew it was gonna be a great deal. So I just said, Hey, let's do it. You know, tax this price was 420 K. You know, I went and financed at 420K. So I just said, hey, it's going to finance at 350K. Are you willing to lower the price down by 70K to get a finance? Here's my pre approval letter at that purchase price. He said, sure. You know, that's how you negotiate, right? I just show him, hey, it wouldn't appraise or no bank will lend on it at 420K, but I got a bank to approve me at 350K. And I showed it to him. He lowered the price, got under contract, you know, huge value add deal, got a hard money loan down 25%. So about 80, 80K, I put in about 120 worth of renovation. Um, so technically the hard money loan has renovation built into it. So they're willing to give me 100K for renovations. But, you know, as I shared in one of my other videos, I couldn't pull all 100K because if you don't follow the scope of work, then they basically will not give you the money, 
right? Like, so if you deviate from the scope of work, let's say I need to replace um, the staircase and I was on the scope of work, they're not gonna give you that money. So I was able to get about half the money from renovation, but the interest rate was 9%. So I didn't, you know, I had the money already. So I just said, okay, I'll just put the money out of my own pocket. It's fine. Um, and then now I'm doing, in the process of doing the cash out. So the hard money loan was actually due uh, May. So I have to end of this, this month and I was able to buy some time by saying, Hey, I, I'm almost pre-approved, um, through bank of the West. And I just got, actually got my pre-approval letter, uh, yesterday. So I just sent that over to the hard money lenders and Hey, like, you know, I got pre-approved for this loan amount, uh, through bank of the West. So they're going to probably need another like 30 days to get the appraisal. You know, it takes about one to three weeks to get the appraisal. Then after that, about a week to do all the paperwork. Right. So if I'm lucky, I get the appraisal within, you know, one week, I tend to can close really fast. So that's kind of what I'm doing and currently in the process of doing that uh, hard money cash out refinance right now. I'll make another video talking about it. I made one currently. So yeah, that's kind of a lot, but that's my whole real estate journey from zero to nine units over the span of six years. And I gradually did this. Once again, I condense all my knowledge, all my learnings through podcasts, through my other mentorship into my own course, into my own mentorship down below please click on it down below. If you have any questions about it, leave a comment down below. I typically respond to those and hope to see you join my community and join a community of like-minded people that all want to learn. So I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you so much.